going to share about a uh, kingdom principle which is of great importance to us all. Okay, now the first verse, of course, uh, you all know this verse very well, and it says here that, but seek first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the emphasis of the kingdom of God has always been upon the heart of Jesus. So he came to preach about the kingdom of God. And therefore, if the kingdom of God is of importance to Jesus, then of course it is of importance to us. We are the disciple of uh, Jesus. So the Greek term is the word called basilia. Kingdom means basilia. It's used 162 times in the New Testament. It means reign, means the, the, the reign of God, the rule of God, or the kingdom. Or in the gospel, it means the new world order related to Jesus Christ. So this basilia is a very important word for all of us. Now, some of you may question about the difference between the word kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God used 68 times, and then the kingdom of heaven used 32 times, mainly used by Matthew. And understand that Matthew was then writing to the Jewish people. And so he used a lot of this term called kingdom of heaven. Now, in our study, we discovered that this has been used, the term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven has been used interchangeably. So, for example, if you just check in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23 to 24, you find that Jesus said to his disciple, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, Matthew used this to address to the Jewish audience. Then he said, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So you find that kingdom of heaven is also used as to identify or be, uh, you know, same as the kingdom of God. But there is a particular distinction if you want to uh, really understand the, uh, you know, the detail of the meaning, all right? The kingdom of God is being used often by the gospel writer to, you know, versus the kingdom of man. It's to tell you that the kingdom of fallen man would be different from the kingdom of God specially prepared for man. And then kingdom of heaven is always used in contrast with earth. So that uh, is a domain. Whereas God is a person, heaven is a domain. So when you see the kingdom of heaven is basically point to a domain, the supernatural domain. And then here you find earth will be the natural domain. And then the kingdom of heaven, which is the domain of the king uh, of heaven, is in the kingdom of God. Because kingdom of God is far bigger than just heaven. Kingdom of God includes the whole universe plus our little earth, plus all the heavenly uh, domain, all right? So if we have, like we have third heaven, we have second heaven. Now third heaven is where God is. Second heaven is where the angels and demons conflict. So these two uh, areas we don't touch because they are not under our care. We are in the first heaven. First heaven is where the earth and the surrounding atmosphere is. So we are here. So God has given us dominion after when Jesus came. He died on the cross for us. He has given us dominion over the first heaven. Therefore, when demons disturb us in first heaven, we can cast out. But demons in the second heaven, only the angels can cast them out. The angel can attack them. 
but we are not assigned and given that appointment to attack the demon in second heaven. And therefore, do not point to the second heaven and try to attack the territorial spirit there. The territorial spirit in the second heaven, uh, they have been invited by the inhabitants of the first heaven. It means that the, the people of the first heaven, when they start to worship them, then these creatures have been invited to dominate over their life. And so they have been voted in. So they have the legal rights. So no matter what you do, you try to rebuild them in the second heaven, they won't move because they have been invited. So leave them alone. But what you can do is that when you are in first heaven, you can use your power and authority given by God to attack them. So we are an invading force. Yeah? So, and then the kingdom of God is eternal, whereby the kingdom of heaven right now is temporal, right? Because there will be new heaven and new earth. And then the new heaven and new earth will last forever. But right now, even the earth that we, we are now living in, this earth is a temporal one. And also the heaven, the, the old heaven will also pass away. Now, try to understand that Jesus did not come to give us a religion. He came to give us a kingdom. Therefore, be kingdom-minded and not so much uh, becoming so religious. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. You can see very clearly the father in heaven is very happy to give you the kingdom. Now, be very careful if the devil lies to you. The devil is a liar and he will tell you that you are not a prince and you are not a princess and you are not of royal stock, all right? So then they make you live, live like a slave, act like a slave, live like a loser, live like a victim. No, you are not a victim. You are not a loser. You are the child of the most high God and because the father has given you the kingdom. And then you find that Revelation 5 then say, and have made us to our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Which means to say that during the millennial reign of Christ, when Jesus will come back again, that 1,000 years of millennial reign, we will reign with Christ. Now for those of us here, when we serve the Lord here, and we labor for the Lord here, we will be called to reign with Christ in the millennium. But for those who are lazy, who refuse to serve God, even they got saved, they will be saved. But when in the millennium reign, they will not reign. They will be the workers. All right. So this is, is either you, you serve now and reign later, or you reign now and you serve later. And so... The kingdom of God, you must understand, you first must have the king. And of course, Jesus is the soon coming king because at this moment, the king of the earth continues to be Satan, but his kingdom has been tarnished. His kingdom has been conquered over. And we, the subject, right? We are the people, the disciple of Christ. We are now taking over. And that's why we must go to all nations. The gospel must be preached to all nations. And so we, the subjects, we are the people who have been sent by God to take over this earth right now. And the territory will be the whole earth. And then we will be preaching the Lord of Christ, not so much the Lord of Moses, but the Lord of Christ that depicts grace and mercy. Okay? So he's talking about righteousness. It's talking about peace. It's talking about love. It's talking about joy. So all this we are going to be sharing with the people. And so I, I need you to understand a little bit of the term called the age to come. Age to come is the kingdom of God. Because when Jesus said in Matthew 12, 28, he said, but if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. But yet you find that 
the kingdom of God has come, but we still die. How come? And then many of us still get sick. What happened here? Some, like myself, we receive miracles. We were healed miraculously. But yet some still suffer from diseases and then suffer from imperfection in their health and imperfection in their financial status, imperfection in the social status, imperfection in everything that they are doing. How come? If the Lord says the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what is going on here? So let's look at the chart here. I want to explain to you about this age to come. Is uh, First, you understand that we are living is in this present evil age. You look at the arrow down below, the blue arrow is called the present evil age, which means that Satan still have partial control over this present evil age. Uh, but before Christ, he has full uh, reign over this present evil age. And then when Jesus came, then he said that if I cast out demon by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come. So when he starts to attack the kingdom of Satan, then you find that the kingdom of God has invaded. And so this is called the kingdom of God that has come since Jesus came. And this kingdom of God is a future age. It's called the age to come. So for those of you who study theology, you may want to read book by George Ladd, all right, the, 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 the scholar who wrote about the age to come, all right, the presence of the future. Okay, so, so the future, the sampling of the future perfection has been introduced into this present evil age. So this imperfect age has now received a sampling of perfection. That's why you find miracles continue to happen. But yet, we are still living in this imperfect age. That's why we still die. And our bodies still go from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So then you find that in this uh, present age, that right now, when Jesus gave us power and authority, the kingdom of God is known as already already in existence means that this is called the already and not yet which means to tell you that yes partially you can experience the reality of the kingdom therefore you can cast out demon you can heal the sick you find that casting out of demon only happened when jesus came the time when king david when he was uh, playing the harp you know and he he chased away the demon from King Saul, it wasn't casting out. It was pacifying uh, King Saul. But the demon still worked actively. But when Jesus came, the power to cast out. And so you look at Luke 9 and Luke 10. right? Luke 9 and Luke 10 says that Jesus gave power and authority to the disciple and they could cast out demons and heal the sick. And today we are the disciples we can heal the sick and we can cast out evil spirit. So the age to come is already here, but not in its fullness because it's not yet. So I don't know if you can understand this, but this is the situation that we are now in. And so at Calvary Cross, Jesus sealed the covenant, right? Which means that the covenant he has with us. So we become the covenanted are people of Christ. This is very important for you to understand. You are covenanted. That's why you cannot make a covenant with any other gods. You cannot make a covenant with any other people like worshipping your bosses or worshipping your wife or worshipping your children. You cannot. You cannot worship yourself. You cannot worship your job. You cannot worship anything, not even your car. Right? I noticed, you know, one of my neighbors uh, years ago, uh, back in Singapore, he bought a BMW. Every morning he will wake up and he'll polish that car because he worshiped that car. So you have actually people worshiping things, but you cannot make a covenant with anything, anything except with Christ. And then after you make a covenant, 
then what happens here is that you become Christless. A Christian is a small version of Christ. So that's why you must become, you must take on the image of Christ. You cannot live in your soulish self and full of pride and expect to be known as Christless. Christless, all right? So you, you know, the little Christ, the Christless. Now, when the Christless, the disciple of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, this is something that happened. This has never happened in history that in Acts chapter 2, that power of the Holy Spirit not only come upon you, but come, come inside you and stay with you and that you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You find that you are far greater than John the Baptist and John the Baptist was known as the greatest of all the Old Testament prophet. So John the Baptist was far greater than Elijah, Elisha, and all the others. Okay? But Jesus said, the least of the kingdom, you are greater than even John the Baptist. And all of that. You know why? It's not because that you, you are handsome, or you are brilliant, or you are smart. It's simply because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Once you recognize that, then you know that it's not the power that resides in you, but it's the person of the Holy Spirit that resides in you. And that is most powerful because he is the one who is the producer of all power. Means God, the divine being, has come to dwell inside you. Why is he doing so? Is that so that when we engage in spiritual warfare, we are able to have that continuous presence of God to fight the devil. The only way the devil can, can, can uh, the only tool that the devil can use against you is a lie. It's to tell you that you have no power, you don't have the person of the Holy Spirit in you, you are terribly hopeless and useless. That's a lie. And I'm sad to say some Christians actually believe a lie and some pastors actually preach a lie. They say that we are actually powerless who are we? We are useless, we, know, we are hopeless, and so on and so forth. No, the Bible is very clear. He said, greater things shall you do. What is that? That is about you, you know, do what Jesus did, and even greater than what Jesus did. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is inside you, and you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so once you have the Holy Spirit, you see the multiplication here. You see, as long as we have the Holy Spirit, we will continue to win souls and we will continue to make disciples for Christ. And then all these little Christlet shall be spread all over the globe. Excuse me. So it's important for us to know that we are powerful. <clears throat> because we have the person of power with us. So then, we will come to the end of the age, means that the end of the age will come when we continue to attack the demonic world, take back what he has stolen, and then preach the gospel throughout the whole world, then the end shall come. When the end comes, what is going to happen is that we are going to enter into the millennium kingdom, and then the 12 apostles shall rule in Israel over the 12 tribes, if you read in Ezekiel 48, you find that the 12 tribes have been, uh, uh, you know, they have been properly apportioned. And then the 12 apostles will reign there, will, will rule them, and then uh, King David will come back to rule Israel. And then Jesus would also be in Jerusalem, and he will be the ruler of the world. And you and I will be uh, reigning will be ruling, and some of you might become a uh, governor of Salango, and some of you might become uh, maybe uh, mayor of Subang Jaya, and so on and so forth, or PJ, or Sungai Bulo, or whichever area. This old earth will still be here until the 1,000 years later. Then you find that Satan, now earlier on, Satan will be bound and shackled, and then 1,000 years later, he shall be released and he shall be uh, offered to tempt 
those people who had been born during the millennium, and then those who uh, turned towards him, and then they will all later on be judged at the great white throne. So that is another topic that we can talk about. Right. So what are you here for? You are here to colonize the earth. You have been sent to earth for the purpose of bringing the environment of heaven and to become a part of this world. So you find that when you pray that prayer or when Jesus asks you to pray that prayer, you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you see the environment of heaven must become a part of this earth. So kingdom colonization is the process whereby the kingdom of God exerts God's influence, God's will, and God's authority over the earth. And you are responsible. I am responsible. Right? Now, you cannot transform the world with worldly ways. So today we are going to talk about first thing is your transformation. You have to become transformed yourself before you are effective in fulfilling the great uh, commission. Because you can't give to people what you don't have. If you tell people about righteousness, you don't have. If you tell people about peace, you don't have. If you tell people about truth, do you have. So all these are part and parcel of this transformation. That my God said that he was very happy when you got saved. He was very happy the day you accepted Jesus Christ. But he wasn't very happy with your image. Because your image was that of selfishness, self-centeredness, the soulless self, the soulless self. All right? And he wants to transform you. And so Jesus said to all of them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, this sermon, this kind of sermon, few people love to preach about it. Why? Because it demands that he says that if you want to follow after Christ, you must deny yourself. He didn't say the Holy Spirit is going to help you, but that you must be willing to hand yourself to the Holy Spirit in denying of your self-righteousness and selfishness, and self-centeredness, and self-focus. Then you have to take up your cross. Take up your cross is not just carrying that cross. It means that you be crucified, which means that you die daily. You die daily. Until you die, you cannot become alive. Until you die, you cannot become alive to follow Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's futile for you to try to follow Jesus Christ with your soulish self. With your soul itself. So in 1 Corinthians 2 14, Paul says that, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The word natural man is that word sukikos. The Greek word sukikos comes from the, the, the word soul, which means suke. And so if we were to translate it carefully, it's not natural man, but soulish man or carnal man, soulish man, right? So now you have a struggle between the soulish man and the spiritual man because spiritual man is that man that's being transformed to become like Christ. Soulish man is you still being the captain of your own ship the king of your own domain, and that you are the boss. And you can be a Christian, but you are the boss, and Jesus got nothing to do with your life. So you cannot serve God effectively with a soulish self. Transformation to a kingdom mindset is required. That's why you find that you have to take on the new identity, which means that you have to let go of your old mind that is being conformed to the world. So the very famous verse, Romans 12, 2, that many of you have already memorized, do not be conformed to this world, which means the worldly pattern, the worldly thinking pattern. What's the worldly thinking pattern? It is simply, I am number one. It's I, me, and myself. I am the one. I am the boss. I am the king. 
I am the ruler of my own life. I don't care too much about Jesus. I may call myself a Christian, but I am not really a Christian because I am not transformed into the image of Christ. So, for example, if my name is Albert, and therefore I'm not a Christian, I'm an Albertian. Albertian, why? Because I worship Albert. Every day I wake up, Albert is king. Every day I worship Albert. Whatever Albert wants, I give to Albert. So indirectly, Albert becomes my God. So can I call myself a Christian? No. There is Christ. There's no Christ in my life because I've not been transformed. I've not been, uh, you know, by the renewing of the mind. My mind still thinks about me. I mean, what is my mind thinking about? Me, 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 me. So you see, Paul says that do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this mind is a part of your soul because the soul consists of three parts, the mind, the emotion, and the will. Once the mind is being made up, the emotion will feel it and the will will carry it out. The will is the one that gives the go-ahead for the action. So, for example, somebody offends you. So, you receive the word of offense. And then bitterness starts to rise up. And bitterness, that bitterness in your mind becomes a feeling. And so, you have a bitter feeling. And so, when you see the person, you feel bitter. You feel angry. You feel upset. You want to murder him, which means to say you don't want him in your world. So when you pass by him, you ignore him. You don't talk to him because you have already killed him in your world. You murder him. So that's why Christ said, you will hate somebody, you have already murdered that person. And then after that, your will step in. means that you want to do something bad to him. So you gossip about him, you assassinate his uh, the character, you, 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 you say bad things about him, you do all the bad things so that you can ultimately destroy him. And therefore, this is called the soulish self. Because the number one man has been hurt. And therefore, the number one man is going to destroy the people who hurt the number one man. Do you see the point here? And that's why you know that when we are out there doing business and when we are out there in the marketplace, the temptation to conform to the world is very real. Every time we see somebody, we want to compare, we want to compete. Yeah. So self, uh, solely self is being revealed here. Even as I speak here, you know the Holy Spirit is going to speak to your heart. If you find that you justify yourself a lot, justify why you are doing this or why you behave this way or why you watch pornography or why you gossip about somebody or why you are angry with somebody, self-justification. And then you have self-seeking opinions, your ego and your pride, your selfish ambition, your hidden motive, and then the malicious gossip that come out from your heart. All these are part of the soulish self. And then you find that the soulish self crave too much to be what? To be accepted. Sometimes, you know, when I was a younger pastor, uh, the desire to be accepted, I wanted to prove so badly that I was a very good pastor. And so I became a very driven man, not a called man, but called by God. But I was driven by my dream, by my ambition, by my vision. Yes, I got a very large church, but that was done because I was a driven man until the Lord stopped me. So you find that when you are a soulish person, whether you are a pastor or you are a minister, you are an elder, you are a deacon, you must allow the Holy Spirit to check you whether your soulish self is unstable or whether you have gone into the spiritual self. When you are becoming more like Christ, you know what happened? You start to die to yourself. So you seek to be accepted, to be supported, to be respected, especially we men. If we are not respected, wow, I tell you, the face color all change. <laughs> and to be 
cherished and to be appreciated. And so we also seek to be understood. We want to be recognized. And if something is done wrong, we want to be vindicated. You know, I counsel so many people and I, in the course of counseling, I always hear this, that I want to be vindicated because wrong has been done towards me. But yet the Lord says that bless those who curse you and, you know, pray for those who despitefully use you. Wow, it's like, ugh. It's opposite of what we want to do. So when we seek to be vindicated, we seek to be endorsed. And the worst thing is that we seek to be well known. At my age now, I learned this one thing is that I don't have to be well known. I just need to know the Lord and the Lord, he knows me. Now, whether all of you know me or not is not that important. If you know me, you may not even want to know me because there are a lot of flaws in my character. But God, by his grace and mercy, has cleansed and washed me and forgiven me. And same with you. So don't condemn yourself anymore. God has set you free and you are free indeed. And then, you know, the soul itself like to what? Compare. When you see somebody, immediately you compare. When I was younger, you know, it was like horrible, horrible behavior of, for the pastor. When I met another pastor, immediately I want to know how big is his church. Because I was comparing myself, you know, as though the size of my church, you know, determined how good I was. You know, how great I was. Yes, I had a church that was 2,000 in size. But now people have churches that are 20,000, 30,000. My church would be considered small. But that was back in the 1980s. And so I was a very proud pastor. And so I was comparing, competing. And oftentimes, you know, when a person say, oh, my church is like 5,000. Oh, you know, suddenly I got a shock. I say, oh. Now I'm, a, now I'm a small fry, I'm a small fish, you see? That kind of a mentality. Always fighting, fighting, fighting. Then become very hostile, intimidated. But when you are bigger fish, then you start to imitate, in, intimidate others. You mock others. Like some of you are businessmen, your business bigger. Then you are like bossy, you know? And now during this crisis time, your, your business has strung, then you are back to normal. <laughs> Praise God. Then you give up your soulless self and go into your spiritual self. There's a lot of rivaling, contending, antagonistic, menacing, scornful. All these are attitudes that Jesus, he does not approve. He wants us to be transformed to become like him. So, Transformation is the law of reversal. Now take note of this, write this down, law of reversal. You notice the kingdom of God continues to encourage you to what? To die to yourself. If you want to be first, you have to be last. That is the law of reversal. You want to be great, you have to be the servant of all. Isn't that true? He said that if somebody asks you to go one mile, during those days, right, you find that the Roman soldier, he, by law, he can just catch a person on the street and ask the person to carry his haversack for one mile. But after one mile, the person can just put down and do not want to carry anymore. That's by law. And the soldier couldn't do a thing about it because that's the limit. But Jesus said, if somebody forced you to carry something for one mile, carry for two miles. You see? This transformation, Lord of reversal. Different. Then you must love those who hate you. You must bless those who despitefully use you. What kind of life is this? This is the transformed life. The repented life. The real life of a Christian. If you are not doing this, start doing this. Because 
you will find that the Holy Spirit in you will be so happy to help you. The very moment you hand over, you don't have to pray a long prayer. You just say, Lord, I hand over this selfishness to you. And the Lord will take it. I hand over this self-focus to you. The Lord will take it. I hand over this anger to you. The Lord will take it. And you will find a transforming power coming into you. That you become a gentler, you become a nicer uh, person. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is not a character change so that you become nice. It's a character change that you might become the image of God. You might become the image of Christ. And so there's a transfer of power and right, rights here. That is on your left hand side is you, me, you, me. And on the other side, Christ is the king. On the left, the king is alive, means I am alive. Albert is alive. But then what happened to King uh, Jesus? King Jesus is the hidden king. Means nobody knows about him. When people look at your life, they see you are obnoxious. They see that you bad temper. You are cursing your staff. You are scolding the customer. You are misbehaving. Means that you haven't transferred your power and your rights to Jesus Christ. You haven't become the slave of Christ yet. The Greek word is doulos. Doulos has often been wrongly translated into servant of Christ. The right word would be slave of Christ. Slave means you have no rights, that he got all the rights, and that he will ask you to do something. And then what happened here is that the internal struggle will be there. Even when I am now sharing with you, you find that your old self is resisting. Your control that you want to control. But you have to let the old self die. The king is dead. The king is dead. And then when you move on to the spiritual self, the new self, which is under King Jesus, then the king is alive and well. Long live the king. Long live King Jesus. So how do we do it? <clears throat> this is how I do it and many of my leaders and church members doing it. But we call it handing over prayer. Handing over prayer. Which means that we all, every day we have FaceTime with, with the Lord. Not Facebook, uh, but FaceTime with the Lord. Means that we go into prayer. And but we go into prayer, which means that we talk to God. Prayer is when we talk to God. We talk to God. Yeah. Meditation means that we keep ourselves quiet and we start to focus upon the presence of Christ. And then you find that God will start to speak to us. So in prayer, we do the handover prayer, which means that I have this struggle with my bitterness. Somebody hurt me. Somebody attacked me. Somebody unjustly used me. And I'm hurt badly. And I hand over this inner struggle to the Lord. Just like that. Just hand over. No need to go into all kinds of ritual. Just say, Lord, you know this brother so-and-so said this word. And it's hurting me. And I have made a mistake. I have taken ownership of this hurt. And so now I own this hurt and this hurt is killing me. I want to surrender this to you. So I surrender the hurt to him. I surrender the statement the brother made against me to him. I surrender the brother to him, that brother who hurt me. Did you realize that it's a lot easier for us to forgive those who are unbelievers than for us to forgive the believers? When a believer come and hurt you, you will find very, very tough. Very, very tough. Yeah? Because you say, because of your expectation, you say, he's a Christian. He shouldn't know how to behave. Right? And he shouldn't lie about me and so on and so forth. Because of your expectation, you see? And because of your presupposition. Uh, pre Therefore, when you find that your presupposed idea is here and the reality is here, 
the presupposed idea meet with reality, they clash. Your presupposed idea is that Christian got to be kind and shouldn't tell lies. And then you meet a Christian who is unkind and telling lies. And when that clash, that's when you start to feel hurt and bitterness arise. See the point here? So what happened here is that you go to the will of God. You must know the will of God. How do you know the will of God? Is that you start to uh, read the word of God, talk to God every day, knowing the will of God. And then you find that this is your will. When your will cross, crosses with the will of God, what must happen? It forms a cross, but what must happen? It means that when you form that cross, when your will crosses the will of God, you got to crucify on that cross. When my will meet the will of God, I am crucified with Christ and God's will must be done in my life. Then you find the transformation can happen. Then greater things can you do. Then the kingdom principle is not only spoken, but revealed. The Lord of reversal is being revealed in your life. People can see that you are truly a disciple of Christ. And therefore, I conclude by Luke 9, 23, that says, Jesus said to all of them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. All right? Take up his cross daily and follow me. All right? Praise be to God. So that's all that I have to share with you this, this afternoon. And I pray that this word will be helpful to you and that you will uh, allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. Can I pray for all of you before I pass the time to the organizer? Let's raise our hand to God and let's accept his blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you for calling us to be your children for we are royalty, we are princes and princesses. And today, Lord, we are given the privilege to be transformed, to become like Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord. Transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Transform us by us surrendering ourselves to you. And every time, Lord, when we compare and compete and that we have this hostile feeling, let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and allow, Lord, the voice of God to be so loud and bring us onto that narrow path again. The narrow path of sanctification, of purification, to become more and more like you. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen. All right.